Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Early Years Podcast. My name is Amanda, and I'm an early childhood educator facilitator with the Durham District School Board. And today I have a special guest that's going to talk to us about STEM in kindergarten. And she is Jane, and I am the STEM and Science Facilitator for K-12 for the DESV. Uh, I've been a teacher for 20 years, and my passion is looking at how science and literacy intersect. I'm really excited to have Jane here today to talk to us about STEM and how to use STEM as a jumping off point through storybooks. And so we're going to get started by talking about what STEM is mm -hmm. first so that we have an understanding and a shared understanding of STEM. And then we'll move into how we can use storybooks with STEM. So the first thing we should just make sure everyone is uh, on the same page about is that STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And STEM is more than just sort of activities or a bin or something you do on Fridays. It's about looking at how we could solve real world problems with the application of science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we're engaging kids in thinking about their world and how they can tackle some of the world's problems or even just everyday problems that we have by using a method of problem solving and thinking. Oftentimes an image that helps me when I think about STEM is to think of a puzzle piece, to think of how a large puzzle fits together and how for kids, one of the best things we can do to promote STEM is to have them see that these things are interrelated, that there's overlap between them, that there is an intersection point that is interdisciplinary. So how does science butt up against math? Well, math is a tool that we use to solve problems. Uh, in science, or maybe we're looking at a problem, we're trying to break it into steps and we're thinking like engineers. And that thinking helps us to be able to tackle a technological issue that we have. And, you know, when we think about that in our own frame and in our own mindset, we do an awful lot of problem solving using STEM thinking when the data projector doesn't work mm -hmm. or when our car won't start. And we begin to work through a series of, well, I'm going to check this. I'm going to check this. I'd like to try this. These are all inherent skills we have, but it's making kids aware, helping to bring that awareness out where they see the connections. Now that's, that's a magical thing. And the last thing I just wanted to touch base on before we get into talking about storybooks is that STEM is more than just the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math. It's about collaboration. And it's about helping kids acquire soft skills. We often hear them called that, or you might hear them called global competencies or 21st century learning skills. But how do kids learn to listen to each other and solve problems together? That might be something that we work on in the lens of global citizenship. It might be classroom citizenship. Um, but that idea of compromise and listening and communication and how we solve problems in a creative way is so critical. And I think about the magic that takes place in those early years in kindergarten year one and two, where kids are starting to formulate a lot of these ideas for the first time. Perhaps they were um, in a daycare beforehand, perhaps they weren't, perhaps they're an only child, perhaps they have siblings or blended families. So when we invite all of these kids into this shared space, the work of STEM is actually happening every time we teach them to turn and talk, every time we teach them how to come to circle, every time we do whole group instruction, or we do guided groups, or we're doing free play. These are all important skills that we can reinforce for STEM. So as we talk today about how we can incorporate storytelling and how stories help us formulate STEM. I just wanted to, to be clear about the things that you're already doing that are STEM and how we can weave those things in as another layer to STEM. So um, I think we'll talk about a couple of books that I happen to love and some ideas that I have around that. That was awesome, Jane. Thank you so much for really making us think about STEM in our classroom and how we're already doing a lot of STEM work already and how we can start looking at it that way and even talking through it with our, our children in our classrooms, how we can talk through that problem solving that we're doing all the time and making that visible to them through that. Because yeah, we are doing STEM constantly. I know um, getting the sound to work when I'm trying to show them a video on our projector screen, I start talking through the steps that I'm taking in order to solve that problem. I'm doing that thinking out loud to make 
our students see that, yeah, we're we're constantly using our STEM our STEM brain to um, solve these problems in the real world. And I think that's really important. So the first book I'm going to talk about is called How to Code a Sandcastle. The books I've chosen are trying to move us away from the three little pigs. While I think that is a brilliant beginning, kids love to build and they love to create. I think that looking at going beyond the three little pigs is important or perhaps going beyond um, fairy tales. What does it look like when we choose books that don't have what might conventionally be prince and princess or white characters? How, how do we reflect the lives of our students in the books that we choose? So the first book that I've chosen is called How to Code a Sandcastle. It's by Josh Funk and illustrated by Sarah uh, Palicios. And the reason I love this book is because of the inherent STEM thinking that's in it, but also because there are inherent pieces of what is coding that are embedded in a rich, rich way throughout the book. Um, it's sponsored by the Girls Who Code Network. There's a lovely forward in the book um, from uh, Rashmima Sayunji. I apologize if I've mispronounced her name, but she is the founder of Girls Who Code, and uh, she is a beautiful forward in the book that I hope that you'll take the time to look at as well. The story follows Pearl, and Pearl is on her last day of summer vacation. She'd like to build a sand castle and she'd like to get her robot friend to assist her. She faces lots of challenges around where to build, why to build and how to build. And so I think there's lots of opportunities here to, to look at this book, much like we would have looked at Three Little Pigs. So Pascal is her trusty robot friend. And one of the things that we see early on in the book is that when we start to talk about coding, it's a language. How do we get a computer to understand what we want? We have to speak the language that a computer speaks. So that can be very exciting to get kids starting to think about what are all the languages they've heard of or that they know? How can we go to um, language in what we're doing? So lots of great language connections. Um, I love that she works through a lot of the coding pieces like choosing language and sequence. How do we get our ideas in order? in order to make sure that we do things the right way. So I see lots of connections that are natural to procedural writing. How do I share the steps I take so someone else can do what I do? Some of the other things that we find out later on is that we can create loops. Loops is another coding language. How do we repeat a sequence of steps so that we can do something again and again and again? Um, and then later, we talk a little bit in the book about if I want to do this, then I can do this or else I can do something different. We use this if then else, which is a logic piece. So often when we offer kids choices in our, in our classrooms, if you continue to slap your friends, then I'm going to have to ask you to go and to sit down in the calming corner or else we have to come up with another way for you or another person for you to talk to because slapping isn't acceptable. We can use the language of logic and coding, even in the discipline that we do or in the redirection that we choose. I don't like to use the word discipline, but I do believe that good discipline is always important. I love that Pearl takes the time to persevere and we see the different challenges that she faces. And there's never that angry, oh, I'm going to give up, but rather, oh, no, I guess we get to try again. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we love some of that social emotional learning that takes place in the book as well. One of the last pieces is that it reviews all of those concepts one more again. So it's going to take us back through the sequence, the loop, the debugging, which is finding errors in your code, the if then else. And um, my favorite line of the book is simply that once we've coded a sandcastle, we can code an entire kingdom. The idea of, you know, now we have the skill, what comes next? When I think about some of the STEM activities that go along with a book like How to Code a Sandcastle, they could be simply getting kids to build castles. That might be something that they want to try. They might want to draw a picture of a sandcastle and then using glue they might want to learn how they would cover that in sand so that the outline of the sandcastle is covered in sand. Well, that requires a loop. First, I draw a picture. Then I put on a little bit of glue. Then I put some sand 
on over top of the glue and then I shake the sand off. All of this taking place within maybe a sand table or a designated space in your classroom. So we already have a lot of the pieces of coding in mind when we do daily tasks. It's just that we've never thought of them as coding. Mm -hmm. So there's so many great ways that we can engage building sand castles, much like we would the three little pigs choosing different materials, but we're now doing it from the lens of coding which is part of engineering, science, and technology. So it's it's a rich book. It has lots of opportunities. I love that Pearl is um, African Canadian, uh, and and that uh, her robot Pascal is gender neutral. And so we're we're not saying that robots are boys or robots are girls. Now the name of the robot is Pascal. So some people might say that is a boy's name, but you know I don't I don't think that in mentioning the the gender of the robot that uh, or the name of the robot doesn't indemnify a gender. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. I was even thinking as you were talking about how to code a sandcastle and talking about sequential steps and how we can use that as a jumping off point for writing the steps on how to even just make a sandcastle if you were going to the beach and talking about first, what do we have to do? We have to pick a spot. Then we have to fill a pail with sand. Then what are those actual steps that we have to do to build a sandcastle and talking about those in steps and really breaking that down can help our the children in our classroom see the ways in which we 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 have a problem and to find the solution we have to go through a, a, a certain set of steps mm -hmm. so even just thinking it through it that lens is also is also a great way to as a jump off point for coding and there's so many alternatives too to even thinking about the basic materials you know there might be kids in your classroom who have actually never built a sand castle yes. out of sand what does kinetic sand look like yep. what if you were to actually take them outside is there a space in your outdoor play area where you have a sand table could you actually have them exploring building with different shapes doesn't even have to be a bucket mm -hmm. what are things other than a bucket we could explore with how tall can we make this thing because mm -hmm. i mean there's just so many different ways to engage the thinking of the book and the series mm -hmm. of steps you might take and the challenges that then might become who can be who can build a sandcastle that is able to stay up the longest uh, in terms of a number of days mm -hmm. and that you know you're looking sort of a, at a long term piece as opposed to the tallest yep. or the longest so so there's lots of different challenges but even uh, dry sand versus wet sand if yes. there if there's a sand table in your classroom and it just has the dry sand in it and there's trying to build a sand castle well why isn't it working mm -hmm. letting them explore that and finding a solution to why the sand isn't sticking because it's dry and letting them have that problem solving time. I think that you've touched on something that I love about the early catalyst system and that's simply wonderment mm -hmm. that I wonder why I wonder why it won't stay together. Mm -hmm. What could change? Okay, I'll try water. I wonder how I could, you know, um, get the sand to come out of the pail easier. Mm -hmm. Do I need to pack the sand more or not? These are all things that kids naturally and intuitively do. Mm -hmm. We're curious people, and I think promoting that curiosity is so important. Yeah, and as educators in the early years, noticing and naming that learning and talking about that problem solving that they're naturally doing mm -hmm. is also a great way for them to see that happening in the real world around them. And mm -hmm. seasonal too. I mean, you might start with sand, but what about snow? Yeah. Right. And I think that, you know, how to build a snow castle would be just as exciting yeah. in many ways. Yeah. So I brought a second book. Yeah. Uh, this one's called A Royal Ride, Catherine the Great's Great Invention. A lot of people may not know that Catherine the Great is actually the inventor of the roller coaster. Oh, I didn't even know and that. And in French, the word for roller coaster is Montagne Russe, which means Russian mountain. That's because Catherine the Great built the very first moving mountain or Russian mountain, which is a roller coaster. So the French translation of the word is actually in honor or in name of Catherine the Great. And Catherine the Great really wanted to have um, have a roller coaster because she grew up in Russia. And in the snowy winters, they would build huge ice slides in Russia. And they would have daring drops and thrills and rides for all. But in the spring, all of those would melt. And Catherine the Great didn't want that fun to end. She wanted that to be a year-round piece. And so she started to create her own drawings uh, that she could then give to her royal engineers to assist her in creating mountains. So this book is called A Royal Ride, Catherine the Great's Great Invention. It's by Kristen Fulton and it's illustrated by Lucy Fleming. And the thing that I love most about the book without you know, sort of going through it step by step is, is the thinking and the trying again that you'll see the inherent perseverance. But there are actually drawings in the book that sort of show her thinking. How did she begin to plan for something like this? What would it look like? What did it need to do? 
What were the challenges? What were some of the um, the barriers or parameters? And this is what engineers do. They sort of look at, you know, what do I want to do? What are the constraints? Who am I building it for? Why am I building it? Um, and how can I make it happen? And so um, the fact that we get to sort of see into the mind of of Catherine the Great and how she drew her pictures and considered all of the constraints. You can see the engineering piece that's inherent in it. Uh, and she actually does get to go for um, a royal ride at the end. And simply the last line of the book says, Catherine had no idea that her man-made Russian mountain was the world's very first roller coaster. And so I just, I love that sort of piece. When I think about some of the challenges that we can do around the thinking that the book presents, I think about all of that rich vocabulary around um, top and bottom, high and low, all of that rich vocabulary about around and down. One of the activities that I have enjoyed doing with this was simply to take some, um, some foam insulation for pipes. It's, <laughs> pipe tubing or insulation for pipes. You can buy it at Home Depot and you just cut it down the middle. You can also do this pool noodles. Mm -hmm. And then it's simply looking at getting the kids to roll a series of things down a track. How do you build a roller coaster? Yeah. Um, and what kinds of things can we do to see how things roll? And that might extend into a whole series of explorations around ramps, around height, around uh, the angle of descent, right? How steep something might be, maybe the it's more shallow. Uh, what happens when they roll balls down the hill in your schoolyard? Um, where are places that they can explore some of their ideas? Um, and it doesn't have to be that you have a huge space even. I mean, uh, some of the tubing I've taped, I just tape it to the wall yeah. <laughs> with a bunch of painter's tape that comes off easily and doesn't ruin the paints. Your you know, uh, custodial services aren't upset at you. <laughs> and ha having kids explore and have fun. And they may have seen a roller coaster before and they may not. So it's, it's sharing with them mm -hmm. what roller coasters might look like. But I think some of the fun is in having them know that it was a child like them who was looking at something and saying, I wish the fun didn't have to end. So what am I problem solving around? And I think about the rich connections we can make to social emotional learning when it's time to be going home or it's time to take something apart or it's time to put away, okay, the fun is ending now, but how can we extend the fun in a new way on a different day? So I love some of those pieces that might not traditionally be thought of as STEM, but again, that problem solving around how can we put into place new learning and a, do, a new way to play uh, that, can, that can take uh, some of that learning in a very different direction. I'm also thinking of some of our reluctant writers that might love to build and they're always in the building center and how do we pull those literacy skills mm -hmm. and other areas of their learning from that and I love that this book has a great jumping off point with her drawings and her diagram showing how she um, wanted her uh, roller coaster to be built but that's just another area another way for our students to enter into their literacy skills as well and extending their learning beyond just building with the blocks and what else can we embed in that and I love that story that it, it highlights the whole scientific process it's it's not just oh I'm just going to build this it's the thinking that goes behind it the reasoning behind it as well mm -hmm. yeah and there's just so many books out there what I would encourage uh, anyone to do my background is as a science person, but I have um, the equivalent of a three-year degree in English too, which made me a very like an anomaly when I was studying at the post-secondary level. People couldn't understand why I wanted to do chemistry in English. Um, but I think the lens that it gives me is that every time I read a book, I'm reading it from this from this lens of I, I want to look for the science in the book. What are some interesting things? What does this make me think of? And I think that when we ask ourselves those questions, but more importantly, when we ask our kids, our students, those questions, mm -hmm. that we have this rich learning that we can jump from. So uh, whether it's your first time exploring a book or maybe your 20th time exploring a book, reading that book from a fresh lens, what what in here is something that we can create as an experience, uh, as a method of asking a question that we can then iterate around and ideate around? How do I how do I change the learning in this book? I think any time that we can get kids involved in coming up with an idea, making it testable, and coming up with a conclusion to their own question, we've hooked them for life on problem solving and we've begun the journey of engaging them in a way of thinking and that's that's what mm -hmm. stems all about yeah. thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the earliers podcast jane i really love talking to you about 
these books and how we can rethink how we're doing STEM in our classroom and how we're already doing STEM in our classroom. So I really want to thank you for coming. And I know we have some future episodes coming up with you. So if you want to hear more from Jane or listen to some other um, episodes of our podcast, make sure you are subscribed to the Early Years podcast. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at DDSB Early Years. And I hope you all join us next time. Thank you.